This is the Lou Rockwell Show. Professor Ralph Rico is a senior fellow of the Mises Institute. He's Professor Emeritus of History at State University College in Buffalo. I want to highly recommend his DVD set of lectures on history that you can buy from Mises.org, or in fact, you can listen to for free. But today I want to talk to Ralph about an issue that our great friend Murray Rothbard thought was the most important public policy issue, if I can use those dread words, public policy. Murray Rothbard held that war was the most damaging and maybe most central issue of the state aside from its, its taxation, its theft. But today, Ralph, the whole right wing, the whole conservative movement seems to make war the central glory of the state. Well, I mean, it's a famous incident in history how the leftists, the socialists, hijacked the word liberal and used it for their own purposes. And now, in our own time, this cabal has hijacked the term conservative and use it for their own purposes. There was a time when conservatives in America believed in a uh, prudent foreign policy for the U.S., avoiding occasions for war. I mean, in the earlier generation, who were bigger conservatives than Robert Taft and Herbert Hoover? And they are now dismissed by these neoconservatives as uh, isolationists. So it's true that the people who call themselves conservative nowadays, for the most part, are in favor of a a war-mongering policy. But as Americans, I think we have to go back to the famous statement that war is the health of the state. Uh, Why? Because in every respect, once uh, war is entered into, the freedoms and the property rights of the citizens are diminished. I think that you know this work by uh, Dr. Robert Higgs called Crisis in Leviathan. Great book, yes. Yes. And there, Dr. Higgs discusses American history since the time of the uh, war between the states up until, well, the Vietnam War at that time. And it shows that what happens when we enter a war is that government expenditures skyrocket. Uh, The number of military and civilian bureaucrats increases tremendously. Government regulations of uh, the economic life of the people increase. When the war is over, well, there's a um, period of relative normalcy, but the number of government bureaucrats never goes back to what it was before. And the level of government expenditure never goes back to what it was before. There's a ratchet effect, in other words, and this ratchet effect over a number of conflicts in uh, recent decades has led to this government that the founding fathers could never have imagined. Ralph, the neoconservatives who seem to almost totally control American foreign policy under the Bush-Cheney regime definitely have illustrated your point in, in the last seven years. In fact, it strikes me that we may have seen a bigger step up in government power, at least in, in the police state area than maybe even during the Vietnam War. That's true enough. So you might say that we're fortunate enough to be living in the middle of an experiment and what happens uh, during wartime. But, you know, uh, you say Bush Bush Cheney. I don't think it's going to be very much different under the Democrats. Obama is in favor of, of somewhat reducing the Iraq war, but he doesn't say totally doing away with American presence there. But he wants to transfer troops now to Afghanistan. He doesn't want to end the war against the Afghan tribes uh, who are opposing American uh, NATO um, intervention and occupation. And this is typical of what happens in our political system. Uh, They say we're uh, on a global crusade to bring democracy to the rest of the world. But what kind of democracy do we have when both major political parties, the only parties that have any chance of taking over the government, agree fundamentally on foreign policy. There are slight differences, but both of them are globalists, are interventionists, uh, want, to, uh, want to keep our, uh, what, 160 bases that we have around the world, armed forces in Korea and Germany. What are we protecting Germany against and dozens of other places? Well, I must say, I, I used to think that McCain would be worse than Obama. Mm. Now I think that, that probably is not true. And one of the things that's alarmed me about him I think of it as sort of the Obama of Nazareth trope. I mean, certainly the state always seeks to compete with God. The state would like to be God, as in the yeah, ancient right. pharaonic days. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Obama's yeah. a religious religious aura. Yeah. Um, is, you know, I must say I find it very disturbing. I mean, has any other presidential candidate ever given a, a presidential speech in a pagan temple before? I mean, he actually gave a speech in the Temple of Hercules in Jordan. Mm-hmm. I mean, it struck me as a slightly odd thing. Well, just to have all the gods on his side. <laughs> <laughs> and another mark against him, as far as I'm concerned, is his um, policy, his announced policy, of tremendously radically increasing so-called faith-based initiatives. Now, faith-based initiatives, which Bush brought in, uh, as far as I can see, has nothing to do with, with faith, which uh, in America has always been something voluntary. A government 
handouts to ministers, uh, uh, priests, rabbis, whatever, putting them in debt to, uh, to the government for these favors. This has never hap- happened in America. I don't know why it's considered uh, to be, uh, not to be in a violation of the First Amendment and separation of church and state. But anyway, Obama wants to show his religiosity by increasing them tremendously. I wanted to uh, bring in um, a quotation before uh, we lose track of uh, this argument about war being the health of the state. The quotation is from James Madison, who is considered the father of the Constitution. And this is what Madison had to say about war. Of all the enemies of true liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded, because war comprises and develops the germ of every other. War is a parent of armies. From armies proceed debts and taxes, and armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for bringing the many under the domination of the few. In war, too, the discretionary power of the executive, the president, uh, is extended. No nation can preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. Something to keep in mind now that we're engaged in an endless war against uh, terrorism uh, that's been announced by this administration and not um, not been disowned by uh, the so-called opposition party. Ralph, certainly ever since Lincoln and McKinley, Wilson... Roosevelt, Truman, Nixon, Johnson, Bush, the move towards what is essentially an elected dictatorship, mm. a, uh, a four- or an eight-year dictatorship, has been intimately intimately connected with the, the president's role as commander-in-chief. Oh, yeah. Uh, commander-in-chief, of course, uh, simply means, uh, uh, or meant originally, that once war is declared by Congress, then the president deploys the forces of the United States, the armies and the navies. Uh, They're not going to have a whole Congress trying to um, micromanage a war. But that's once war is declared by by Congress. Of course, as you know, uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. uh, By the way, it's interesting that uh, Congress is the focus of Article 1. They only get to the president with Article 2. Anyway, this article in the Constitution says Congress shall have the power to declare war. And again, Madison explained why. It says it's a very dangerous threat to liberty uh, to, uh, to put the power of war and peace into the hands of one man. Um, he would have his own uh, uh, reasons for entering war, uh, entering into war. Better to have it in the hands of the representatives of the people, uh, the House and, and, and the Senate. Well, what's happened, of course, and in, in the, the last time Congress was asked to declare war, of course, was on December uh, 8th, 1941. Since then, the Congress, um, and, uh, except with a very few exceptions, are such unbelievable cowards. Since then, co- Congress has voluntarily uh, given up, uh, un- unconstitutionally, because it's not permitted to give up uh, its own authority, but given over to the president the authority to, to uh, uh, declare war, or not, if not to declare it, to actually engage in war, as, uh, warfare, as in Vietnam, for instance, for years on end, uh, because they don't want to take the responsibility of having to say yes or no to war. Uh, this could lose them some constituency. This could lose them some, some votes. And rather than do what they're constitutionally mandated to do, what they swore to do, to uphold the Constitution of the United States, they simply hand over to the executive the right to declare war. And um, what, it's, what it's turned into now is that this one man, um, or his advisors, or whoever is controlling him, who's ever in uh, in back of him, uh, can decide to bomb, invade, uh, boycott, um, uh, damage in uh, through uh, uh, financial means and the, in- the international uh, money markets. What all the the, the tremendous uh, uh, arsenal of of power that's in the hands of the executive of the United States can can do this so- solely on his own. Ralph, when Bush was getting ready to launch his war of aggression against Iraq, the the second war of aggression against Iraq, Ron Paul uh, tried to argue in the International Relations Committee that while he was uh, very much opposed to this war and, of course, would vote against it, uh, they ought to at least declare war and obey the Constitution. And uh, Henry Hyde, the beloved conservative uh, uh, creep from Illinois, 
um, told him, no, this is ridiculous. It's an anachronism. Yeah. Uh, and that that part of the Constitution had no applicability. Well, anymore. as they say, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments don't have any applicab- applicability anymore. So, you know, why not just blot out uh, the various parts of the Constitution that uh, don't uh, uh, suit their uh, aims? Um, did, they, did they also uh, laugh their heads off at, at um, Ron Paul saying something like that? Oh, sure. No, they were yucking it up. Yes, they thought they, it was ridiculous. As they did in the debate, uh, Romney and Giuliani and so on, when uh, Ron Paul introduced a concept, which I guess these uh, people wanted to be president of the United States had never heard of, called blowback. Yes. That there was a reason, of course, would. Look, I'm in New York. There's no question of justifying the destruction of the World Trade Center towers. It was horrible. It was an atrocity. But there was a reason, and that was American involvement and interference in their own countries. Uh, Ron Paul said, uh, which was for a long time the traditional American foreign policy, we mind our own business and we expect them to mind their own business. Ralph Rako, thanks so much for being with us today. And I want, to, I want to mention your articles on Churchill especially, on Truman, and the rest of your archive at lewrockwell.com. And uh, people should also listen to your lectures on history and buy the DVD at Mises.org. And thanks very much for, for being here. Thank you. You've been listening to The Lou Rockwell Show, produced by lewrockwell.com, the best-read libertarian website in the world. If you'd like to advertise on this podcast or on the website, Email advertise at lewrockwell.com. And thanks for listening.